Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Chang. We are now continuing on our equity investments and valuation models. Uh, we are now going to work on basically our price and enterprise value multiples. This is also kind of bread and butter uh, of your equity section. You're going to have to know things, you know, such as price to sales, price to book. It's going to be there, right? So if you're if you're not comfortable with this stuff, make sure you get comfortable. All right. So here we go. Now, the method of comparables, meaning uh, as we go through this, involves using a price multiple to evaluate whether an asset is relatively uh, fairly valued, meaning relatively undervalued or overvalued uh, in relation to a benchmark value multiple, meaning uh, overall like the group of its peers, right? This is actually the, one of the most widely used methods by analysts because it's real, uh, very simple to do. You can do it really quickly. And the economic rationale is the law of one price, meaning if everybody else is pricing at this particular PE ratio and you're in the exact same business and your PE ratio is some, something different, then there's going to be, that's telling me potentially that there may be an undervalued or overvalued situation. In the method of comparables, the price is scaled by the measure of value, such as sales, uh, earnings, book value, and cash flow. The, then we compare that multiple to the benchmark multiple. And what is that benchmark multiple? Uh, it includes the multiple of closely matched individual stocks or the average or median of like, the stock's peer group uh, or companies within that industry. For instance, if I'm comparing United, uh, I take its multiple and I compare it to the average or median of all of the other airlines such as American Airlines or Southwest Airlines uh, to see if it's overvalued or undervalued. Now, there's also a method of forecasted fundamentals. I can get my, my uh, relates the multiples to the company's fundamental growth risk and payout, meaning I look at its multiple and then I calculate one using what? basically discounted cash flow model. This then will tell me whether it's overvalued and undervalued. Notice the differential between this and what we talked about before. Before we were comparing what? Comparing the multiple to other companies. Now we're comparing the multiple to a discounted cash flow model. This is a forecasted fundamental method. It permits the analyst to uh, explicitly examine how valuations differ across stocks and against uh, a benchmark given different expectations of, let's say, growth and risk. Now, price multiple uh, fundamentals, basically a justified price multiple, what the price multiple should be if the stock is fairly valued, right? Um, also warranted and intrinsic price multiple, meaning if the actual equals a justified, then this is properly valued. If the actual multiple is less than the justified, then it is undervalued. If the actual is greater than what is justified, then it is overvalued. So if we were gonna do an example, if every, uh, let's say, you know, typically airlines let, uh, have a PE ratio of eight, and I have an airline with a PE ratio of, let's say, 20, um, what does that mean? That means that typically uh, the Airline, the airlines are trading at, let's say, eight times their earnings, um, or let's say in a more simplistic standpoint, it would take you eight years to earn your money back. Now you have a stock that basically will take you 20 years to earn your money back or is trading at 20 times uh, its annual earnings. So thereby, if the actual multiple is greater than, let's say, the justified, uh, then it would otherwise be overvalued. So what do you need to know? For relative valuation methods, such as PE, price to book, price to sales, and price to cash flow, and even dividend yield, knowing the following uh, for each ratio, uh, ratio. So we're gonna go through, throughout most of these slides, we're gonna go through individual each of these, right? And for each multiple, we're gonna need to know what? What is the rationale for using, let's say, a PE, or price to book, or price to sale? What are some of the drawbacks of that particular ratio? how to calculate the ratio, what are some of the fundamental influence, what impacts that particular ratio, and then also calculate the justified ratio, right? And then evaluate the stock with that ratio, right? So let's start with the most popular one. This is probably uh, 
one of the most popular ones out there, which is the P.E. ratio, right? Price to earnings ratio. The ra rationale is earnings power. EPS is key to investment value. This is a focal point of Wall Street because it is, you know, the most popular ratio out there. Differences in P.E. may be related empirically to differences in long run stock returns, according to research, meaning as, uh, you know, uh, P.E.s, they have shown over uh, in history to have uh, to relate to long-run stock returns, and the ratio can be used as a proxy for risk and growth. Uh, so when you look at a, a stock with a very high P.E., you would anticipate what? It's trading uh, you know, many, many times its earnings because why? People are anticipating that the denominator will grow, and we'll look at that in more detail. So drawbacks, though, for using P.E. ratio. Uh, well, if you have negative or very low earnings, P.E. is useless. If that denominator is negative, uh, it doesn't it doesn't help you right it, it, it is meaningless so uh, if there's negative or low earnings and if it's uh, a volatile or transitory earnings make the interpretation difficult meaning uh, the the e the denominator is actually very uh, uh, moves up and down it's very difficult to have a stabilized PE and interpreting that number becomes a little harder now big one here is uh, well the EPS number earnings number is based off of accounting Right? And this links to your financial statement analysis, meaning this is dependent upon management and their estimates, uh, their accounting treatment, their accounting policies. Uh, and so there is management discretion to these accounting choices. So that EPS uh, number is, has all of the downsides associated with you know, uh, accounting issues that we saw in financial statement analysis. And so we using the ratio avoids addressing fundamentals, meaning growth, risk, and cash flow. So how do we calculate uh, the PE? Um, so using the market PE ratio, the trailing PE ratio is the market price per share, basically the price, and the EPS of the last 12 months. This is PE at time zero. For the leading period from a forward perspective, perspective, instead of using the last P.E. ratio, we use the price divided by the forecasted EPS, e, or E sub 1. Now, problems with the trailing P.E. ratio. When calculating P.E. ratio using trailing earnings, you have to be careful, because if you're determining the EPS number, when you determine the EPS number, things can be what they call transitory or non-reoccurring, meaning they, they have a one-time particular event. Uh, that may be uh, specific to the particular company, um, things such as like discontinued operations, and we'll see some of the examples in a second. And there's cyclicality to components of the earnings due to the business industry trends and difference in accounting methods, right? Uh, and this is true with uh, all P ratios because the earnings are influenced by the accounting and the potential dilution of EPS uh, through a more complex capital structure, uh, such as uh, uh, convertibles or warrants or options. The goal of an analyst is one to remove any non-reoccurring items from earnings. Because look, you're trying to forecast what's in the future. What happened yesterday doesn't, is not going to tell you whether or not it's a good investment moving forward. So here are, like I said, some of the uh, non-reoccurring items that you would you would try to remove uh, gains and losses on assets, any write downs or impairments that are just kind of these one time events, any loss uh, provisions that they're anticipating losses, changes in accounting estimates as they uh, you know, change their uh, you know, allowances or they change the life of, of their depreci uh, life of their assets in, in terms of depreciation. What you're trying to do is get to a number that is persistent and continuing so that way you can forecast into the future what the what the actual underlying earnings will be and this is kind of very much married with financial statement analysis so when we're looking at PE ratios and when we look at the earnings per share we're going to, we really want normalized earnings and we want to remove the cyclical components uh, of those earnings meaning we want to capture like a mid-cycle, an overall mid-cycle or average of the earnings under normal market conditions, meaning this industry could have certain events happening to it that are not permanent. And then 
find a way to basically remove that component and normalize those earnings. And so the two methods that way that we're looking for, these two normalization methods, I can use historical averages of the earnings per share or average uh, return on equity. And let's take a look what we mean here. So when we look at normalized uh, earnings here, you can see that we have a particular company with earnings per share, uh, book value per share, and return on equity. So here are the years from 2005 to 2008, and their return on equity from 2005 and 2008. So what we're going to do is try to take uh, essentially the average of the earnings per share and the average ROE, and then multiply that ROE from to the last uh, book value per share. So let's take a look on how this is done. So if I take the average earnings per share, we saw this is between 2005 and 2008. Just take a simple average. This is now my kind of average and normalized earnings. Pretty straightforward here. Or I take the average ROE. This is my return on equity for the, from 2005 to 2008. And then multiply, notice, uh, from the most recent book value per share to essentially give, get to my average return on equity. This allows it to kind of smooth itself out and not and normalize the earnings from any cyclical events. Then there's also uh, there's a problem with PE. Like I said before, negative earnings make PE ratios meaningless. Meaning, if you're actually the EPS is actually negative and you're saying it's it is uh, trading at negative 10 times, uh, it just doesn't make sense. So the potential solution is to substitute for uh, earnings to price. Uh, it's simply the inverse of PE. Uh, price is, because the reason why is price is ne never negative. Uh, and high um, earnings to price suggest a cheap security. Um, and then a low uh, earnings price suggests an expensive security. Be, be very careful with the word questions here. Uh, because um, you know, you want to make sure, and, and keep in mind, these are going to be negative numbers, and, and negative numbers, uh, the smaller negative is actually a higher number. So let's take a look at this in an example here. So if I were to look at the earnings yield here, um, I have price, and notice ABC Company is the only one that's actually making money, so it has a trailing PE. And here are my earnings to price uh, ratios here. Uh, and so what it allows me to do is I can now kind of rank these from highest to, to lowest to say what is the most expensive. So you'll notice the highest EP ratio is the one actually making uh, positive earnings. This is the next highest one, so on and so forth, meaning the cheapest security is the negative 0.6% uh, because it has the highest earnings uh, to price multiple. Um, and, and keep in mind, notice the negative number. Uh, the negative 0.6 is higher than the negative 39%. So the justified price multiple, so the justified multiple is a multiple is a stock is fairly valued, right? Um, the forecasted fundamentals, uh, when we use from a fundamental approach, the justified multiple is the ratio of the value of any discounted cash flow model, all right? So remember what we were talking about there for the fundamental forecast. We're not looking at comparables. We are actually going in and looking at the cash flow. We're discounting, let's say, the cash flow or the dividends and finding a value, right? Now, in typical CFA level uh, two cases, the Gordon growth model to, uh, is used to derive justified multiples and identify the determinants, meaning you can take the Gordon growth model and kind of move things around and find your, your PE ratio. And just, uh, you know, you're taking this. You should, by the way, by this time, this should probably be burned into your head. Uh, as far as, um, you know, uh, and this will basically be the foundation of how you get to all the rest of the multiples. All right, so this looks familiar, right? Uh, so if I'm looking at my justified PE, you'll notice that it is my payout ratio over R minus G. This is what? This is my payout ratio, right? Dividend, uh, for the next year over EPS over the next year, meaning what portion of the earnings per share am I actually paying out? That equals what? My payout ratio, right? B 
Because in this Gordon growth model, keep in mind, this equals what? Uh, EPS times 1 minus B, right? EPS sub 1 times 1 minus B, which is uh, the payout ratio. All I am essentially doing is taking the EPS and bringing it to the other side here. And that gets me to my PE ratio. Now, all of these der uh, uh, derivations, uh, all of these multiples are going to basically come from just doing some algebra and you can get there. So your justified trailing PE ratio, so your price uh, uh, time, at time zero, your dividend sub zero times one plus G. Now, how do we do our, our justified? You'll notice the difference is, is that the growth rate is on this side. So uh, this is originally my Gordon growth starting. Keep in mind, this used to be what? That equals what? Dividend sub one. So what I'm going to move over, dividend sub 1, remember, equals what? EPS at time 0, 1 plus G, right? 1 plus G and the payout ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this to the other side and leave everything else in the numerator. So notice these two are left here, right? Just to kind of illustrate how the algebra works, I'm breaking the dividend sub 1 apart into its three components, moving EPS sub 0 to the other side of the equation. I now have price divided by EPS sub 0, or EPS at time 0. Right? Keep in mind, the justified leading PE ratio, just 1 plus the growth rate, gets me to the next period. So fundamental factors that affect justified PE ratio. PE is positively related to growth rate and payout, all else being equal. Meaning, as a higher PE would basically justify a higher, uh, basically related to a higher growth. It assumes no interaction between G uh, and the payout and ROE. And what, what, does, that, what does that mean? Because uh, they're assuming that it's not affecting the return on equity the growth and return on equity payout in ROE, because remember, G equals what? ROE times B, which is the retention rate, and 1 minus B is your payout ratio, right? And it's, not, it's assuming that those are not interacting uh, together. And this is also another way to derive it. This is equal to what? This is B, right? And PE is inverse related to the required rate of return. Uh, and the real, uh, real rates, inflation, and then equity risk premium, all else being equal. If you're on test day and you are kind of, you're in a word question, you don't really know whether PE is inverse related uh, or, or you're kind of stuck, just write out the equation. So if you're writing out the equation, PE, let's say, uh, is 1 minus B over R, minus G, right? Now, we know that this equals what? R equals risk-free plus beta times risk of the market uh, minus the risk-free rate, right? Now, here is my equity risk premium, right? And then I have real interest rates here. So if these things start to go up, and then R goes up, this goes down, that means PE goes down. So as this, as the required rate of return on equity, which is impacted by real interest rates uh, and inflation, which makes up the risk-free rate, and the equity risk premium, as those go up, the required rate of return on equity goes up, and notice the PE falls. So I don't have to memorize what is positively or negatively related. I can actually just take the formula, draw a couple arrows, and the answer actually comes out. So it only takes a couple of seconds. I'm just trying to save you some just dead memorization. All right? Predicted, uh, if we're looking at the predicted PE from a regression, uh, what we can do is the PE and the company characteristics are, are essentially measured cross-sectionally. And we basically regress uh, the P's are regressed against the stock and company uh, characteristics, right? And what are we talking about uh, here is that we're looking at 
things such as uh, uh, beta or, or payout ratio or earnings, and we're regressing them against uh, the PE ratio. And the estimated equation basically exists the relationship between PE and the stock's characteristics, basically positive coefficients to growth, payout, and beta. Remember in quant, you were doing regression. Um, these things were, uh, these are your independent variables, and then your PE becomes your dependent variable. And you're looking at what? The slope, right? The coefficients to see if they are significant and looking at those particular characteristics uh, to basically predict what the PE is. So a little bit back from quant, PE being what your, your model is actually forecasting. Uh, each of these are your essentially coefficients uh, to basically predict what the PE would be for that firm. So when I d predict the PE from the regression, so my dividend payout ratio, so here's an example that we're going to uh, go through. The regression related to a public entity, so think quant, right? Here is my model. This is my model. I'm trying to predict the PE ratio. This is my model. I'm going to enter in the data into my model to predict my PE ratio. I ran a regression, uh, and the regression model came and, and showed me that these were the coefficients. Now keep in mind, remember in quant, I probably still need to test the model, right? Uh, just kind of a review. Uh, I still have to test the model. I test the coefficients, um, see if they're significant. And let's say that I assume they're significant, so I'm going to start using this. I'm going to take the dividend payout ratio. I'm going to take the beta. I'm going to take the expected earnings, and I'm going to chuck them all into this particular equation to forecast a predicted PE. So let's take a look at how this looks. So looking at the question here, when I actually applied the model, you'll see that I had the y-intercept here. Uh, I plugged in the 0.4, which is the dividend payout, and its corresponding coefficient. And then I have the expected earnings growth rate of 3%, uh, expressed as a decimal, and its corresponding coefficient. And then I have the beta of 0.6 and its coefficient, and I get to a 7.4x. Now keep in mind, these regressions are useful for larger data sets where you have a lot of data. That way you can make an, an effective regression. Um, however, it's infrequently used because there are some issues, there are some limitations associated with it. Well, first off, changing relations. When you run the regression, are, are the uh, independent variables, uh, as they relate to PE ratio, um, those relationships can start to change. We also have a problem of multicollinearity, right? You guys remember in quant, what is that? That's when the uh, coefficients are correlated to each other, right? So let's say if I'm doing, uh, you know, payout, uh, and then I'm doing payout and growth, right? So payout ratio is 1 minus B, right? And then growth rate is ROE times B. So there could be some issues from multicollinearity. And then there's basically an idea that there's an unknown predictive power of the actual regression. Um, and this is where kind of some of the statistics come in to see, you know, is, is it really, uh, is the model sound? Valuation using comparables, so we, we looked at um, you know, fundamentals, now we're doing comparable price multiple. Uh, we're going to select a benchmark. We're going to look at other companies, right? Remember the United and, and American Airlines and Southwest example. Um, and we're going to calculate the mean and median PE uh, ratio and compare the stock's PE with the benchmark PE. How are the other companies? What is generally um, that they're looking at? There are observed differences between the asset and benchmark. Uh, are observed differences between the asset and benchmark explained by uh, the underlying determinants of PE? Meaning, if it is wildly different, is there something that's making them wildly different, right? If not, the assets may be mispriced, meaning if the PE is wildly greater than how every other peer is priced. However, if it's because they basically came up with, let's say, the, uh, something, they had a competitive advantage uh, in some cases, then perhaps it was justified. And if you can't find that item, then it might be mispriced. So, what? Other things that we can look at also is the peg ratio. The peg ratio is a stock's PE divided by the expected long-term earnings growth rate. So notice I'm expressing PE, uh, and this is as a whole number, not a decimal, uh, as, a fun uh, as the denominator to actually PE. It calculates the stock PE 
per expected unit of growth. Notice the lower the peg, the more attractive the valuation. And the higher the peg, the less attractive the valuation. Uh, because given that, you know, as you have, you want basically a, and, and keep in mind, why, why do we want this? Because I want a stock that's going to grow, right? Well, if everybody knows that the stock's going to grow, the PE is going to be really high. So I want a stock that's going to grow, but I want a stock that no one else thinks is going to grow, but I know that it's going to grow. So uh, notice what happens. If the G is really high, this whole fraction comes down and the numerator comes down. That would be the most ideal situation with the peg. These are attractive. A uh, low peg ratio create is, is attractive because I, I think that the earnings growth rate is really high. Uh, and I want, you know, if, if the PE is also really high, then everybody else knows that. And it may not be priced attractively. So problems with uh, peg ratios. Uh, the differences uh, in firm risk attributes, they're, they're not really, they're only focused in on what? Earnings and growth. They're not looking from a risk perspective, right? Uh, because one company versus another company could have a, a larger amount of leverages. And the duration of the growth, um, there's basically, they're not addressing what is the duration, if there is a high growth phase, right? If this, they have a current high growth phase, what is the how long that growth is going to occur. And there's a nonlinear relationship between growth uh, and PE ratio. This makes comparisons more difficult. So comparisons more difficult. All right. So when we look at from a terminal value estimation standpoint, the terminal value the value projected at the end of the estimation horizon, meaning remember in these uh, discount uh, models that we saw in free cash flow equity dividend discount model, we're looking for that terminal value uh, that we're going to discount back. So we're, we're going to find that terminal value by using what? The, a trailing PE and then times the forecasted earnings. And that'll basically get me to a price. Now, I can do it two me methods. I can do the fundamental method, which we use what? Requires estimates of growth, R, payout, right? Correct? Because remember, that's just the algebra of the Gordon growth model. Or comparables using market data. Basically averaging, remember we took the average, uh, for average or median of, let's say, all of the other airlines, United, American, Delta, um, and then compare, use those as the PE ratio to calculate the terminal value. Now, our next multiple is our price to book multiple. Uh, basically, our and, and it basically uses book value per share to represent the actual investment, right? It's using book value per share as, as a representation of the actual investment and the common shareholder that, that the common shareholders actually put into the company. Book value per share, uh, how do you get to it? It's calculated by the common equity divided by the number of shares outstanding, all right? Sometimes in, in, in the exam, they may not give you that just because they're going to mess with you a little bit. So you potentially may have to do what? You, there could be a situation where you had to add up the pieces of the equity. Or re always remember, and you probably learned this in level one, assets minus liabilities equals what? Your equity. Then you divide that by the number of shares outstanding. All right? So there is only a current price to book. There is no leading uh, price the book value because you're not going to forecast the book value uh, essentially for the next period. So why why would we what's the rationale for using price uh, price to book? The rationale is it's usually uh, positive even when the earnings is negative. So uh, this avoids the problem of having negative earnings. It's less volatile and the big thing is it's more stable than earnings per share, right? It's good for firms with mostly liquid assets like financial firms because then the, the book value per share doesn't suffer from that many uh, accounting issues. Uh, useful for distressful firms in liquidation because we're really focusing on what? The investment uh, that, represents the sh uh, the, that represents the shareholder's investment. And the differences in price to book ratio explain differences in long run average returns. Uh, 
And so let's take a look in further. So the drawbacks associated with uh, price to book ratio, you could already guess uh, one of the main ones uh, is, is going to be the accounting. But it also, it doesn't uh, reflect things such as like intangible assets or off balance sheet assets, meaning intangible such as like human capital um, or off balance sheet financing. Uh, just some examples like lease, uh, operating leases, uh, SPVs, these, uh, these all, all, you know, off balance sheet special purpose vehicles. And mi maybe misleading when you're comparing firms with significantly different asset sizes. You got one really, really billion dollar firm and you have another firm that's a couple million dollars, right? Now, or the big thing is here is uh, different accounting conventions can essentially ob obscure the comparability, right? Like the difference between GAAP and IFRS. So if you think about it, um, we're looking at book value, right? So book value is going to be in the denominator. And uh, if you remember in financial statement analysis, uh, under, uh, just as an example, under GAAP, research and development costs are typically expensed, right? And then under IFRS, research uh, and development costs, but development in some cases can be capitalized, right? May not seem like such a big differential for as far as comparability, but if I ask you in the case of a pharmaceutical company, where are they spending most of their money? Research and development. So if I have a company under IFRS versus US GAAP, then think about what the book value is going to look like, right? You're going to have one that basically has capitalized, let's say, a lot of their development costs and a US company that's essentially expensed it. So this could be uh, these differences in county can be really huge, especially in specific industries, uh, and that makes this comparability much more difficult. Right? So inflation uh, and technology changes can also cause different, big differences between the actual book value and market value, meaning I am assuming that the book value represents the equity, uh, the shareholders' investment in the firm, but the book value may not take into effect that your book value, your historical costs, you've been depreciated, the company's been depreciating that, let's say straight line. However, let's say there's new technological advances, then those particular assets may now be worth significantly less, thereby distorting the price to book uh, from a market value standpoint. And this is also true with inflation where the book value, well, I'm just depreciating the asset downwards. It's not factoring in uh, you know, price changes due to inflation. Justify price to book. By using the Gordon growth model and using the expression G equals B times ROE, the retention rate for the sustainable growth rate, the expression uh, for the price to book is, is kind of shown below. Now keep in mind, this is still a variation. There's two things I really want to point out. You know, just for the fun of it, maybe, maybe we'll do a little bit of the algebra, but before we kind of do go there, I, I do want to point out, notice that uh, they're both multiply, uh, subtracting G from both sides, and essentially I'm taking ROE, in, in, in all intents and purposes, uh, taking ROE over the required rate of return, meaning uh, the, re the return of the equity over its essentially fair return, dividing it by that fair return. Hold that thought because when we get to residual income, it's just going to be really related to this piece. So just plant that seed in your head that, look, I'm taking ROE divided by a fair return. So this, this eventually will be very, very closely related um, to, to things such as uh, economic value added and residual income. All right, let's, uh, let's just kind of play around and, and, and do a little bit of algebra. Um, I mean, there's plenty of ways to do it. Uh, so if I, if I take... Uh, let's say the Gordon growth, uh, or oh, actually we'll, we'll, we'll start with price to book. So if I start with uh, price to book, and, and let's assume this is book value per share, um, and what I end up doing, I have ROE. What is ROE? ROE is basically what? My earnings per share, right, over book value, right? That's my return on equity. That gets me the ROE portion of the equation. And then I basically will subtract out G. What's G? G is ROE, which is also EPS over book, uh, times basically what? The retention rate uh, is basically my growth rate, right? So, and this is over R minus G, 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take uh, take uh, these out. So what I what I end up with is EPS over B, and I'm left with one minus B. This should look familiar. One minus B is the what payout. And I divide that by R minus G, and this still equals what? Price over book. Now, if I multiply and I bring the book value to the other side, essentially what happens? The book value disappears, uh, and what do I end up with? I end up with, so bring that over to here, price equals what? E, uh, EPS uh, times 1 minus B over R minus G, and we know this equals to what? Dividend. And that gets you to your kind of Gordon growth model. Notice, it's just some algebra moving it around, and you still get the answer, all right? Um, so still the same kind of uh, number there. Real quick, just wanted to run through that, so that way you can see how, how essentially it is how we get there, all right? Now, the justified price to book, basically the fundamental factors affecting price to book. Remember, I showed you in that last slide, it's, it's the re, uh, return on equity over the required rate of return. And the larger the spread equals value creation and then higher the market value. Because why? You are getting me, uh, as an investor, additional return over the fair return. And that basically will do what? Give increase the value. This is kind of the foundations of what we'll see later of residual income model, right? Firms that earn ROE that basically equal the required rate of return of equity will essentially have a price to book of one. Because remember, it was what? ROE minus G over R minus G, right? Correct? And so it, imagine essentially the same number on top of itself. Uh, it, actually, it would eventually just, it would equal one. So also think about the concept here. If the return on equity of the company equals its re required rate of return, you're not getting me anything in addition, right? You're basically uh, giving me a fair return. That probably doesn't excite too many people. All right, so let's take a look at the fundamental factors that influence price to book ratio. There's a positive relationship uh, increases as ROE increases price of the book also increases as the growth increases. Just take a look at the equation if, if, um, uh, on test day if you're looking at it. Uh, you have ROE minus G, and you have R minus G. So as ROE goes up, you'll notice price to book also goes up. And as G increases, you'll notice if G increases, uh, this bottom number becomes smaller and the entire fraction also increases, which dominates the, the fraction more. Uh, there's an inverse relationship associated with as uh, required rate of return decreases and as well as falling risk, interest rates, inflation, and beta. So if we were going to write out the return just in terms of cap M, you'll notice that as we increase uh, beta, R starts to go up. As R goes up, what happens to the equation? Price the book then starts to fall because the as this goes up, the fraction then comes down. This is true uh, any time the required rate of return starts to go up, thereby creating an inverse relationship uh, with price to book. 